Amen. Amen. What a wonderful rendition, huh? Truly a fitting song for this morning's meditation. We want to say a special welcome to our online viewers, for those who have just logged on, whether you're viewing us via Facebook Live or YouTube, we say welcome, welcome, welcome. Go ahead now, we ask, and do your missionary activity. Please copy that link and put it on your Facebook page and let others involved in this morning's study. And do we all have a lesson this morning, study guide? All right. I mean, here at Wellington, we do aim at the heart, but we also aim at the head, right? And we want to get something in your head and somebody in your heart, which is Christ Jesus. So we want to engage everyone this morning. And we're going to have a word of prayer. We have a lot to cover. We're going to move right into this morning's study. Let us, let us pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we are eternally thankful and grateful, dear Lord, that mercy and grace still rules the hour, and that you are able to save to the uttermost and the guttermost those that come to Jesus by faith. I pray you'll be with us in this morning's study, and may we get a glimpse of the eternal world. May we become more steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the love of God, knowing that our work is not in vain, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we are going to move. We are continuing in our series, 1844, Re-Examined and Reaffirmed. And it is ever a date, I believe, we need to re-examine as a people and to reaffirm in the minds of this generation. Is this, this date, 1844? We are on um, Lesson 5D. Right? And we're looking at the first, the first, the feast of first fruits, right? And friends, we have been saying that um, we actually have one more installment left on this um, feast, and then we're going to transition to the feast of, of Passover. So we're almost halfway through this series. And I think we'll be having about, about 30, 34 lessons, study guides. So you may want to invest in a binder, amen? Uh, because you're going to have 34 lessons of paper just all over the place. But it's a good series you want to get, you want to keep in your auxiliary. And listen, um, you know, when we do a series, it's, it's a slim chance I'll ever do this again. Um, you're going to have to have a session, Sister, sister Foot. Um, so once we do a series, that's almost, that's it. Um, so if you'd like to receive the PowerPoints, especially those who are here to use it, River God, you, you'll get them. Amen. We're just here to give and to empower and to equip the people of God, right? And so, friends, we encourage you guys to, you know, you got to read. And again, I, I, I implore you, you can't let me read for you, amen? You're going to have to read, and you don't have time. You're going to have to fight for time in this time-consuming world to read. Don't let the job and society and life so crowd in your time. You don't have time to read. And friends, if you are not reading, I pity you, you're in a bad shape. Gonna, and we, we've been promoting these books now for the last uh, uh, six months, right? Um, good books to get on the sanctuary. We also encourage you guys to get the book Great Controversy and be familiar with these chapters. They also highlight the work that Christ is doing now in the most holy place and our work, amen? But we also, we, we give a little book as a, as a treat. I think we have some, right? Uh, the f we have some, all right, today? A few, all right? All um, right. Not to give away, if, you, if you'd like one and you don't have one, we highly recommend you get this book, um, The Feast Days. And what it does, it does, a lot of people within our churches, you know, you have so much genres of Adventists today. I mean, I've never seen like this in my life, man. There are so many fractions, this one, that one, and you're like, what's going on? But you do have those amongst us. Um, they do hold to the Feast Days, and they believe you ought to celebrate them just as the Jews did back in the ancient times. And I disagree. I strongly disagree, right? But if you need some ammunition to help to stabilize you, this is a very good book, biblically, exegetically. And I think we have a few copies. You can keep this in your auxiliary and also read it. Amen? There were seven feasts, right? Um, four in the spring, three in the fall, Passover, First Fruits, Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, Trumpets, the Atonement, and Tabernacles. And we believe as we look at these feasts, they do give us insights, incredible insights, in the plan of salvation. And each of these feasts, they do, they are designed to teach a particular doctrine, right? And we've said that the doctrine that this feast teach, unleavened bread, is resurrection. 
And the vast majority of us who get to heaven will get there by resurrection. Right? And only a small group of people will get there through translation. And I tell you something. You know, these people are rare. These are rare, 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 rare people. And we ought to strive, she says, to be among the 144,000 and, and be not deceived because they are not normal. They are abnormal, right? And they are totally committed to Jesus, right? And, and, and doing his will, right? And again, we've said, friends, that the devil, he despised these deceased these and he doesn't want us to know them. We realize, friends, that we are in the sixth. We've been in the sixth now for a over, over 170-something years. That's a long time, right? And remember, all of these seas had a day. Um, Passover was one day. Unleavened bread was seven day. Wave sheet was one day. Pentecost was one day. Trumpets was one. Atonement was one. Only tabernacle and unleavened bread were seven days. So there was no need for Christ to be in the most holy place in 160-something years, 70-something years. That's, that's, that, that's, that's a long time. And it, it, it attests to his long suffering because once he steps out, that's it. The filthy must remain filthy, right? So I believe that he's, but he won't remain there long, a long time, right? And only one more left and tabernacle. And so, friends, we, what, if you're going to make a move for Jesus, you have to make a move now. If you plan to surrender and do, do, you know, get your life right, you have to make your move while we're under the sixth. Because once the seventh comes, it is too late, right? Types and anti-types, we've discussed, right? They're parallels, right? Not identical, but they do match up, and we're now on the type. Now, we've been some friends that you want to you view Christ, you have to view him through these lens, right? And it does gives us um, a different dimension of Jesus Christ. And just by way of um, quick revision, as we look at these feasts from three perspectives, historically, Christocentrically, and also personally. Now, why personally? Because, friends, we do not just want to be, as someone says, have high blood pressure, um, right, and, and anemic in deeds, right? So we want to make sure that we are not high in creeds and low in deeds, right? And so we need to be balanced. And we are told those who have assumed, what? The ornaments of the sanctuary, but are not clothed in Christ's righteousness, will appear in the shame of their own nakedness. So in getting all this knowledge, we have to get Jesus, amen? And we have to keep him, right? We have to be clothed with Christ's righteousness. Now, each one of these feasts, we have texts that we use to, for our thesis, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Paul says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that, what? Slept. And then James chapter 1, verse 18, we're going to cover this next session. Of his own will begotten us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his what? So while Christ is the original first fruits, this first fruits, it applies also to us, right? We're going to look at that. Now, when last we left off, we've discussed that when Jesus rose, right, how long did he spend on earth? He spent 40 days. And this is in the book of Acts. Now, why 40? He could have spent 39, you know, but Pentecost is 50. 50 days after the Passover. So let me just kind of back up. I don't think, Brother Loban, you can, you can do this. But um, let me just, yeah, you stay where you are, right? All right. So between Passover and Pentecost, there are 50 days. So when Christ spent 40 days on earth, he knew that within 10 days, the fourth of the seventh feast would take place. Yeah? And type must meet anti-type, right? So when you look at these texts, you have to look at them through the centuries. So for 40 days now, we're told in Acts of the Apostles when he came, a lot of things that the disciples didn't understand in regards to his priestly ministry, he made it clear. He clarified a lot of things, a lot of misconceptions. Remember he said to them, a lot of things I can't tell you, but you can't bear them now. And what couldn't they, I, I've said to myself, you know, what couldn't Peter, James, and John handle? These guys were rough guys. What couldn't, were they, were they weak? What couldn't they handle? And I've, I've, I've discovered, when you look at Christ's ministry, there was one aspect of his ministry 
which he never disclosed with the, the disciples until after his resurrection was the aspect of his priestly ministry. Because after Passover, remember, the veil was rent in twain. It put an end to the sacrificial system. We need no more earthly priests. Yeah? So once he shut down the earthly sanctuary, he opened the heavenly. So he could now disclose, I'm going to be inaugurated. If he had told them this before Passover, like Christ, really? Come on, you're, you're from the tribe of Judah. And no priest, you're confusing us now, man. You know I'm saying? No priest issued from Judah. All the priests came from what? From Levi. And so within that 40 days time now, we are told he began to open to them his second phase of his ministry, the priestly ministry, right? So for 40 days now, they're in the upper room now. A lot was taking place in Jerusalem while they were huddled in the upper room. Right now, we're going to pick back now and move right in. Question one, we're filling in the blanks. In most cases, I hope you all have a lesson, right? Do you all have a lesson? All right. Question one says now, now what was the general mood in Jerusalem after the death and burial of Jesus? What was it like? Now, here it is, friends. It was one of disappointment. Fill in now, one of disappointment, right? One of disappointment. You have lessons for the guys? All right, good, okay, all right? It was one. Now, why were they disappointed? The Bible says it now that in Luke 24, 21, we trusted, right? We trusted that it would be, had been he who should have redeemed Israel. But didn't he redeem them? But they were looking for a different kind of redemption, right? And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. So they were disappointed, brothers and sisters, and this disappointment is so, was so severe that when you read Great Controversy, she likens this disappointment to the 1844 disappointment. Friends, listen, this was a massive, mogul, major disappointment. You ever seen grown men cry? You know, where I'm from in Jamaica, if a man cry, it's kind of weakness, boy. So as a culture, we tend to kind of man up and, you know, you know, man to cry. You know what I'm saying? It's by yourself, right? But listen, grown man wept October 22nd, 1840. As a matter of fact, one of those who survived was a man by the name of Harm Edson. We're going to recover him in the upcoming lecture, right? Edson wrote this. Our expectations were raised high, and thus we looked for our coming Lord until the clock told 12 at midnight. And they even had that wrong anyway. I'm saying because even in the morning, what I'm saying, right? But anyway, right? The day had, the day then passed, and our disappointments had become certainly. Our fondest hopes, expectations were blasted, and such a spirit of weeping came over us. I've never experienced. It seemed that the loss of all earthly friends could have been no comp comparison. We wept and wept and wept and wept. And they wept until dawn. Not figuratively. Real as the nose on your face. So we look at the disappointment in 31. It, it, it is almost a parallel. And she does parallel it. It was a doom and a gloom and a sadness that hovered over the city of light. But not just a mood of disappointment, friends. It was also a mood. Fill it in now. One of deception. The deceptions that were practiced that weekend was <laughs> unfathomable. Right? One of deception, right? Deception. Ma Matthew, right? Should be one. Yes, yeah, one is a typo. One of deception, right? But it's, it's right in your, in, your, in your lesson, right? One of deception. Now, what kind was practiced? Matthew chapter 28 says now, the priest... Now when they were going on, behold, some of the watch came to the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and were taking counsel, they gave large money to the soldiers, saying, say he, his disciples came by night and stole him away while they what? So deception was practiced. 
And where do you think the priest got the money from? He must hide money. And nothing has changed, brothers and sisters. Because in some cases, tithe money is still being used to facilitate religious deception. People are being deceived and deluded in our churches, brothers and sisters. You'll be surprised. Deception. High-grade HD 4K deception. Deception. But not just the disappointment and deception, one of dread. We talk about faith and fear, brothers and sisters. It, it, listen, when Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem, it was almost like a death certificate. You, 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 are you serious, Lord? This city? The city of blood that cares the prophets? You want us to tarry here? I'm getting out of Dodge. I'm leaving. You see, friends, of dread. What do you mean dread? Dread means fear, phobia. In the book of John 20, the Bible says this now, verse 19 now, then the same day at evening, being the first of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for worship. For fear of the what? You know, my first day friends used this text to, to, to justify the fact that the reason why the disciples were gathered together on the first of the week, they were to celebrate the Lord's resurrection. But remember, hitherto, they hadn't even believed he was, he was raised. And the Bible says the reason why they, they were hidden away it was because of fear of the what? Why, why would they fear the Jews? Because it was exactly, it was the Jews who said to Pilate, if you don't do this, you are not Caesar's friend. They were the one who orchestrated the, 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 the massacre of Jesus, the crucifixion. So they feared for their own lives. Deception, yeah? Discouragement, yeah? And fear, and friends, this, this is the same today in our churches. Friends, it is, things look bad. Friends, I'm not being critical. It looks really bad. I mean, people don't even know where to go anymore. Yeah? It's really bad. And not just that, people are afraid of speaking up and speaking out. Because you get labeled, man. They call you a shepherd's rod, man. They call you offshoot, man. They call you a knot type, man. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And we want to maintain a, a level of prestige, isn't that right? So we sit mute like mummies in our churches. And don't speak up. And I'm not saying we ought to be disrespectful and rude and crude and mean, but there's a time to speak up and speak out. But because of fear, you may become this fellowship. Didn't Jesus say the time will come? Well, they will put you out of the synagogues. Yes. Now, don't jump the gun. Don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters. And we are more concerned about reputation because of our character. That's what will get you off the ground when Jesus comes. A lot of people have good reputation, but they have a bad character. Yeah? And so it was a, it was a scene to behold. One author wrote in Jerusalem at a time, he says, many were pro um, providing answers. Many were providing solutions that did not solve. Many were providing answers that didn't answer and explanations that did not explain. This was the scene, the situation of in Jerusalem. Go over that weekend. Now, watch the situation now. Now, number two now. Now, what will God never leave himself without? Now, we're, we're going to put it together now. Watch it now, right? In Acts chapter 14, verse 17, the apostle Paul writes, Luke writes, and now, nevertheless, he left not himself without a what? Friends, you got to get this, friends. God will never leave himself without a witness. It does not, listen, it doesn't bad how things look, how bad it looks. God will always have a witness. As a matter of fact, there has never been a dispense, a time in the 6,000 years where the devil had total supremacy. Never. You check from the days of Noah, there was eight. And there were many who died before the flood and they were being saved. But in every dispensation, God has always had somebody. May not be in the majority. But remember, one in a minority is a majority with God. Amen, somebody, right? 
And Elijah made the mistake. Oftentimes we think we're the only one. I'm the only one, Lord, and we get discouraged. But do not do that. Elijah felt the same way. And when he ran from Jezebel, you said that, that brother was weak. You know, in our culture, if a man runs from a woman, <laughs> he's weak. But if you knew who Jezebel was, you would run too. As a matter of fact, a.k.a. Jezebel has her counterpart. And when things get sticky, we're going to have to run. <laughs> We're going to have to flee from that harlot, scarlet church of Rome. But God assured Elijah, and jot the text down, 1 Kings 18, yet I have left 7,000 in Israel. Yeah? In Israel that have not bowed their knees to the doctrine of Baal. And every all of us are caught up in this ecumenical, neo-Pentecostal, whitewash, sepulchral religion. There are people who are steadfast, firm about their walk with Jesus. And yea, this 7,000 also included children. Because when you read the, 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 the backdrop of 1 Kings, there was a little girl, little maid. She was there. So this 7,000, not 7,000 muscular grown men. It's men, woman, boy, girl in every age. God will have his people. So friends, let's not become discouraged in the church. Not every pastor is doing wrong. No. Not every member. Not every leader. Yeah. God has his people reserved. As a matter of fact, this is a powerful statement. We are told, friends, we don't hear these statements. We're told in the closing scene of the work on earth, the standards of the law will again be exalted. Amen. False religion may prevail. Iniquity may abound. Never made next box cold. The cross of Calvary may be lost sight of, and darkness like a pale of death may spread over the world. The whole force of the popular current may be turned against the truth. Plot after plot may be formed to overthrow God's people. We're told now, but in the hour of greatest apparel, the God of Elijah will raise up human instrumentalities to bear a message that will not. Be silent in popular cities of the land and in places where men have gone to the greatest length in speaking against the Most High. The voice of stern rebuke will be heard. Boldly will men, generic sense, men and women of God's appointment will denounce the union of the church with the world. And because God, because God appoints them, they cannot be disappointed. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so, friend, God has always have a witness Amen. for the truth. Now, watch this thing now. Now, we're building a case. This will all tie together in a moment. Now, now number three now. Now, how many ascensions are recorded about Jesus? You know, the Mormons teach because I, I have the publication, I probably should have put it on the screen, that Jesus appeared in America yes, to the Native American Indians after his ascension. I said, what, what strange doctrine, man. Very strange. That's why I couldn't be a Mormon. No way, Jose. <laughs> now, the Bible records two ascensions. You've got to get this now, friend. Now, for those of you have the first time, you're missing out something. You're going to have to, you know, go back and watch the videos. Now, the first ascension now is recorded in John chapter two, 20, verse 17. It's also recorded in Desire of Ages, page 7, 9. This is after his crucifixion. Watch it now. John 20 says, now we know it. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which means to say, Master. Then he says, now, Jesus saith unto her, do what? Touch me not, or don't detain me. For I am not yet what? To my father. But go to my brethren and say uh, unto him, I have ascended to my father and go to my father and your father, my God and your God. You know, when you read Desire of Ages, she goes and she tells, she meets Peter. And, and the Bible alludes to it now. That when Peter comes to the tomb, he sees the tomb is empty. And he was skeptical. And he's about to leave. And then he looks at the clothes, how it was folded. And it's so, probably, it's just so powerful. She says that um, Peter looks, and when he sees the garments that wrap Christ's body, 
it was folded precisely, she said he knew that it was Jesus. And the takeaway from it is, you know, she speaks about that even though Christ was about to, to, to fulfill the feast, this grand event, he was not mindful or um of little things. He didn't just get up out of his bed. You know, and, 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 and some of us as parents, you know, we are, you know we're, we're, we're not helping our kids. We're harming them. You know, make your bed is a part of good stewardship. Yes. When we, were, listen, when we grew up in boarding school, boy, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> no. Johnny come late, is in trouble. Man, you, your bed had military style, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it was a part that we, we grew up. You keep your surroundings neat and clean. Yeah? Make your bed. You know what I'm saying? And she alludes it. It's, it's amazing the things you find in the spirit of prophecy, right? But this does support the first ascension. And we've learned last week that this time you went to heaven now, it was the third hour, the time of the morning sacrifice. So Jesus now fulfilled the same time when the priests were offering the omer. Jesus now went to heaven and type, met anti-type. Stephen Haskell said this so powerful. Haskell said this now. In these words, touch me not, Jesus notified his followers that of the great event to take place in heaven. Hoping on earth there might be an answering chord to the wonderful Jerusalem in heaven. But just as they had slept in the garden on the night of Christ's agony and failed to give him their sympathy, so blinded by unbelief, they failed to share in the joy of the Savior's great triumph. They missed it. And it's not coming back again. Right? Little did the inhabitants of the earth dream of the wonderful anti-type offering of the first fruits that was being celebrated in the heavenly temple at the time the Jews were carrying out the empty forms in the temple on earth. Ichabob! And did you know that these Jews continued Passover, unleavened bread, and, and, and wave sheet for 40 more years? It was not until A.D. 70 when the, the, the temple was destroyed. How deluded can you get, man? Tight, but anti-tight. Very serious, right? And so they missed it. They weren't there to share. They missed everything, if you ask. The only Pentecost they really got. Now, if you got four out of three, that's not bad. <laughs> that's half. But they missed Passover. They missed unleavened bread. And they missed the wave sheet. Now we, now, we learned last week when you went to heaven, right? Not in your handout because I couldn't fill it in, right? We're told in our ages now, while the Savior was in, in God's presence, he was receiving what? Gifts for his church. And we need these gifts. We are not going nowhere without the gifts. And I, 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 I fear anybody who's despising the gifts. So he got these gifts. And he came back. He's now. So the second ascension now is in Luke chapter 19, verse 16, verse 19. You'll also find in Desire of Ages, page 829, separate, distinct. He comments on it. Now, the last ascension, right, in Mark chapter 16, verse 19, the Bible says now, so after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. You see, friends, now between these two ascensions, there is a 40 days delay. And we're going to focus on what was happening on earth during that 40 days, right? Now, we're going to now move right into our fourth typology, right? So we looked at three last week, so typology number four now, right? Fill it in now. Type and anti-type, right? Even though the priest waved one omer before the Lord, he also, he also brought a handful of grain with him. So get, get the context now. The priest in the, in, in the earthly sanctuary, he brings the omer, but he also brought a handful of grain. Even though he presented the omer first, there was also a handful of grain with him. That's the type. Look at the anti-type now, right? Look how Christ fulfilled this now, right? Antitype now. At the time of his resurrection, 
many came forth to testify of his resurrection. Being the first, he being the first, and they followed immediately from the time of Adam to Christ. Watch it now. So even though he presented himself, like the priest, he also had a sample. Type meeting anti-type. Now, in the book of Matthew 27, we find this text now, right? Powerful text. Now, Matthew says it now. And Matthew only records this, this text as it is in the New Testament, right? Well, kind of. But in this situation now. And Jesus, when he had cried with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So he's dead. Watch it now. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from what? To what? Look at, look at the verbiage. Not from bottom to top. We oftentimes use this analogy. You get bills in your house. Right? A lot of junk mail. And one or two bill. Real bill, right? So you separate the junk from the real. You may get a light bill, if it's still on paper, right? Or a credit card bill. It has a, a date to be paid, probably a week or two. Because you, you, you open the letter, right? And you say, okay, it's due the 20th. So you have about seven days. You tend to put that bill in a bill pile to be paid. Yeah? Right? Right. Now, once you pay that bill, what do you do with it? You rip it. Now, I've never seen a person rip no bill from bottom to top. Who did that last week? <laughs> when was the last time you tore a bill up and you tore it from bottom? I can't tear my lesson, right? From bottom up. You tear from what? Now, when the Bible says the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, it meant that Christ paid that bill. The sacrifice was paid. You don't need no more turtle dove, no more white flour, no more lamb. The bill is paid in full. You see, and jo we learned Josephus told us the very same time a lamb was being sacrificed. And as that priest was about to hit the juggler vein, he heard a ruckus. That, that, must be the, that was the happiest lamb in creation. <laughs> that lamb got out of dodge. <laughs> ever thankful, ever grateful, right? Look what happened now. And from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks what? So there's a massive earthquake that happened at Christ's death now. Then verse 52 says now, and the graves were opened. Yeah? And underscore, they were previously closed. Stones were rolled away, were opened. And underscore, many, not all, Many of the bodies of the saints that slept arose. Now, friends, this alone debunks the concept that when you die, you go to heaven. Okay, you read this, it doesn't make any sense. Why would they arose if they're in heaven? That's bad grammar. They should descend. If we believe, if, as now we, they believe, you know what I'm saying? But even this doctrine, this text, affirms the fact that when you die, you don't ascend. Now, the spirit goes back to God, the breath, but the body goes back to the dearth, right? Now, so the graves are open, and many bodies of the saints that slept and came forth out of the graves after his what? And went into the what? And appeared unto what? Many. Now, look at the text now. We know Christ rose sometime early Sunday morning. That twilight, right? So some may say, okay, not when were these people raised? Were they raised Friday evening? You know, I mean, you could, you could factually be debated. Did they get up, sit in the tomb? So, they are, so, so they, I mean, so could it be that? Or, you know, some say maybe they got up, they kept the Sabbath in the tomb. And when Christ came out, Sunday morning they came out, it doesn't distort the text, whatever view you take, but the point is that they came out after his resurrection. We don't want to major in the minor, so the minor closed away for the major, right? Now, so powerful, powerful text. And this, is, this is almost like a surreal text. But this text must be viewed in the context of the wave sheet. 
You have to view it within that context or you're going to miss it, the powerful teaching. To take this text from its context, you're doing justice. It has to be viewed in the context of the wave shift. And we've, we've, we've been saying, friends, that Sunday has nothing to do with Christ's resurrection. The reason why Christ was on Sunday because it was the 16th day of Nisan. Passover 14, um, unleavened bread 15, wave shift, wave shaft 16. The 16th, right? That's why he came out. Now, Haskell said this now. The priest did not enter the temple with only one head of grain. He waved a handful before the Lord. Neither did Jesus came forth from the grave alone. Many bodies that stained with slept arose and came out of the graves after what? So even Haskell put this text. This is a sanctuary text, friends. And the reason why most don't get it because they don't understand the sanctuary. Friends, I have come to discover ever since I've started this journey, every text I read in the Bible, I'm saying to myself, where am I in the sanctuary? Or where is this text in the sanctuary? Now, question number four now. Now, which Old Testament prophets prophesied this event? What event, Brother Foot? Matthew 27, verses 51 through 53. Was it prophesied? Friends, yes. It's amazing. Isaiah, who is the gospel prophet, long before Christ was even born, he was a messianic prophet, prophet, prophet. Isaiah wrote more of Christ than any other prophets. Isaiah prophesied Matthew 27, 51 and 53. Look at the text now. Isaiah says now, Thy dead man shall live together. With my dead body shall they arise. With my dead body shall they arise. Where in the Bible do you find anybody getting up with Christ when he rose? Nowhere but Matthew 27. This is not a second coming text. When Christ comes second time, he's already risen in his glorified state. So this text cannot be a second coming text. Look at the text. Right? Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast. You know, it was get out of me, just come out. Kick them out. <laughs> a powerful text, you know. Isaiah, when he made this reference, I believe Isaiah understood in prophetic vision what would happen in 31 AD. One more text now. Go ahead, Sister Foot. You need a mic. You know, so, all right. No, you can't because they won't hear, but I'll have to repeat it. Go ahead now. Um, with that text, do you think that Isaiah was among those prepared? All right. I'm going to answer it. Yeah, yeah. Hold that thought. Hold it, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to it. I'll, um, I'll, we'll, we'll discuss that. But it's a very good point. Maybe, right? One more text we want to use now. Two witnesses, right? David also made a profound statement. This blew my mind. Psalms chapter 68, verse 18. David said this now. Thou hast ascended on high. Uh-huh. Thou hast led captivity. Captive. Right? Thou hast received what? Whoa! What did we just read a while ago? That when he went to heaven, he received gift. But David, this was long before it happened. David was quoting. See, David was not just a king, man. This guy was, was, he was a prophet. He was a, man, this was a priest. Was a, he had all kind of insights. Right? Now, this is so profound now. Thou hast settled upon high, let captive the captive, Thou hast received gifts. Who gave, who gave Christ the gift? God the Father. For who? For us. So these gifts were to benefit or should benefit us. Then he says now, disappointing now, yea, for the what? Rebellious what? In other words, there will be people in the church who would just poo-poo on these gifts. But, but, but still, even for the rebellious also. And friends, I'm telling you, you ever heard the concept fit sinners, healthy sinners? There are people today who have read the spirit of prophecy and who are benefiting from her counsels in regards to health. Yea, the rebellious also. 
They don't want no Sabbath, no Jesus, but they want to live. They want to live long. They, 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 they prize longevity. And so they're taking the counsels, foundings for the prophecy, and they have applied, and it's working. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God Almighty dwell among them. Now, do you know that when David wrote this, the Apostle Paul wrote the same thing? You say, really? Question number five now. Whom else in the New Testament captures this event? Apart from Matthew 27, only one more Bible author comments on it. Paul. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Look what Paul says now. Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended upon high, he led what? And gave what? Who was Paul quoting? Mm -mm, who was he quoting? Did Paul say, I borrowed this? Is there a footnote? Did he put quotation marks? So if you're going to charge, as some do in art with plagiarism, then the apostle Paul was the biggest plagiarist. Because nowhere I read in, in Ephesians, FYI, footnote, I borrowed this from David. Direct quotes, lifted. There it is. It's only narrow-minded people. And I find people who dare, you know, accuse her plagiarism, they don't believe her anyway. It's just an excuse to wiggle out. Yeah. Paul said it. And when, and when you read Romans chapter, now this one is, this one is a tongue twister. You read Romans 8, 29, 30, and it's Paul is referring to Matthew chapter 27, right? So this thing is not just something, you know, small. This thing was prophesied years in advance that this event would take place. But you have to keep it in its context with the first fruits. These are first fruits texts. And remember we said that the first fruits doctrine is resurrection. And again, the vast majority of us, yo, in this edifice, watch it online. If we get to heaven, we will go there through resurrection. So this doctrine must be important to us. We need to be able to die in hope and live in hope, yeah? All right, now. So the answer is the Apostle Paul, right? He gave captivity captives. Now, what were some of the gifts that he received from? Remember, he received gifts. David said it. Ellen White said it. Now, before Ellen White said it, David said it. What were some of the gifts that Jesus got from the Father when he went in 31 AD at 9 AM? Look what Paul says now. I love it. In the same text now, he says now, and he gave some. Now, friends, the order is important. The gifts are placed in their importance based on the order. Order is heaven's first law. Now, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some, some, and some what? Now, isn't it ironic that that which God placed second, we didn't affirm it today. You see where pastors are? You see where pastors is, is, a, is, a, is a fourth string gift. Now I'm not saying it's not important, don't get me wrong. But the gifts are placed based on their importance. Yeah. And so apostles means you need administration. Because heaven is a place of order. Amen. And after 1844, the first thing they did was organize. Friends, I'm telling you, Satan's kingdom is highly organized. If you think demons are helter-skelter, he must say, what are we going to do today? I don't know. Let's go. No, it's a highly organized kingdom. You know why he has to be organized? Because the devil doesn't have omnipresence. If you don't have omnipresence, if you can't be here in Jamaica and Russia, you have to have some high-ranking demons. And they follow order to the T. And so he took a page from heaven. When he left heaven, he took one-third, Yes. But he also took the power of organization. Oh, yes. Highly, highly organized kingdom. To the T. Legion for we are many. 
is broken down to the cadres and ranks. He knows, he knows that heaven is all about order. He was there. Yeah? So then the second gift was prophets. Prophets spoke to the people on behalf of God. Yeah? Priests to the people on behalf of the people. Of the people. So you see, and what the devil has done now, this gift amongst us, it is so despised. And what the devil has done, he has used the prophets to castigate the prophets. The pastor to not the prophets. You see how he's wicked? He has turned the gifts among itself. When was the last time you hear no, no pastor affirming that white? They don't even use her writings. Because they say, you know, we don't want to confuse people. Confuse who? I heard one pastor say, the reason why I don't quote Ellen White on Sabbath is because of visitors. What visitors? They don't come to our churches, brothers and sisters, yeah? Our churches are dilapidated. We, 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 we're all over the place. Come on, which, which visitor? God bless the few that come out. So when do you quote? Prayer meeting? Hello. Sunday night meeting? Those things are archaic. We don't have those anymore, you know. We used to have them back in the days, but today, boy, we've, we've scaled down to two services a week. And our one. And so he has set up the pastors to attack the gift of prophecy. But all these gifts he got from the Father. And Paul says, we need all of them. And then he gave other gifts in Corinthians, diverse gifts, administration, yeah? Operation. He says now there's the gifts of uh, wisdom, right? Knowledge. Yeah? He talked about the gift of faith, gift of healing, working miracles, prophecy, and discerning a spirit. This is a gift, you know. You know what my grandmother used to say? I'm going to feel the boy there now. My spirit will take him. She always had a thing about her, you know. Nobody will bring him back at the house. I mean, in spirit, not right. <laughs> and I would be like, oh, what are we talking about? I mean, I'm a brethren. Next week, he was shot dead. Me tell you, in, the, in my spirit, not take him. <laughs> you just discern. <laughs> yeah, and this is, in some cases, heightening women. You know that? Women can discern something in a boy. Well, they got that, they got that six, seven, eight, nine, ten sets, boy. They say, honey, I want to work with that one there. Trust me. I'm saying it's a gift, tongues, languages, interpretation of tongues. Other gifts. All these were all the gifts that he received from the Father to give to us so we can function under the unction of the Holy Spirit, right? Now, so with all this said, now let's let, let's now transition to number six now. Now, so this is the question that we get now. Right? And I've been getting the question all week. Pastor not. Phone calls. Who are these saints in Matthew 27? Right? And for what purpose were they raised? Right? And what role are they currently playing in the plan of salvation and redemption? Who were they? Now, friends, you know, I, I was going to do it, but I said no. And when you consult the historical books, they do give names. But the reason why I didn't, I purposely avoided it because... I don't have any biblical, yeah? I know Eddie Shimon, these guys are great historians. They are not my foundation. This is my foundation, yeah? And so I try to, anything I put forth, it, I must have a biblical premise. And that's why I quote the Bible first, then all these other guys. Right? Now, I know as a people, we are curious. And curiosity is kill the cat. And the reason why many of us go off into weird doctrine is because we're curious. We, you know, I've learned people, we have a phobia for the unknown. We want to, we raise the unknown. I've discovered people are more eager to hear a sermon on the devil than Jesus. Demons and angels. Man, we, I did that series, Legion for Where Many. Since the amount of phone call I got, people thought I was the king exorcist. Literally, people coming up all over Pastor Nod, my son is levitating. 
And <laughs> come. No, I ain't coming nowhere. Let me see you. <laughs> literally. Literally. I mean, I was barrage of phone calls. All of a sudden, now the, the, the gifts is surface. He's a demon slayer, you know what I'm But they don't want to hear about angels, you know. Forget the angels. We just want to, we want, we want that demon. You'll be surprised. As a matter of fact, I think out of all my series, that one has gotten the most views there. Legion for we are many. Right? But we tend to want to pry into the unknown. And the very known. We don't want it. Yeah? There's no text that says, thou must celebrate my birthday, Jesus. Amen. You don't even find no text. You find plenty of texts to celebrate my Sabbath. You see that, friends? And so, this is a text I, I want to use just to, to, to clear myself. Because I know some of you all came with high hopes this morning. I don't want to disappoint you. Right? But the text that says now, for the secret things, yeah, belongeth unto the Lord your God. But those which have been what? Revealed. Belong unto you and to us and our picking our children and children, right? Now, with that said now, follow me now. There were names that, were, that, that Edishim and Josephus put forth. There were names. And if you read the books, you'll get them. So you'll find them. But I didn't want to go that route. Because I cannot find any biblical backing. Yeah? So I'll say this, Sister Foot. While the scriptures are silent about the names and gender, were they male or female, were they children, right? It is very vocal about their character. Yeah? One of the identifying characteristics of these people was that they were called saints. You need a folk. Let, let, let that be your meds this morning. Forget gender and ethnicity. That means nothing in the scale of salvation. It is character that will determine where you spend eternity. And habits long enough become character. Now, as we look at the text now, there's one word I want us to focus on. And this will, be, this will give us enough to find who they were. The Bible said that they were saints. And that is an incriminating piece of evidence. So we can now put together a puzzle, a picture, as to who these people were and are. Yeah? Now, saints. You know, when I, I came to America pretty early, then they sent me back because I said I was too bad. I think I was misunderstood, Ella, you know what I'm saying? But, but finally, when I, when, one times I came back, because I'm always going back and forth. I went to the park to play soccer, my football, and I met a Spanish, you know, kid. His name was Pablo. And, you know, we became, even today, very good lifelong friends. Wonderful family, the um, Gavira family. They were from Argentina. So it was Pablo, um, Juan, his mother, and his sister, five of them. And that family took me in, man. Boy, I tell you, man, listen, my first kinse. Yeah, we had to learn to dance. Yeah, the kinse. Thres leches. Yeah. Diabetes, you know, make it. You know what I'm saying? Man, listen, these were gone in their home. They had a picture of Diego Maradona. These were hardcore Argentina. I mean, listen, man. His father would bring the, listen, you know you're hardcore when you're watching Argentina in your home and you're beating the drum in your home. <laughs> Wonderful family. And so I played soccer for them. So one Sunday we, we had a game and they, were all, uh, they would always pray. So the first prayer they were going to pray now, we huddled together and the father said to Pablo, Pablo, pray. And Pablo began to pray, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. And I said, hold on. I said, what kind of prayer is that? I stopped him. I said, what about our father? And they said, what? Our, they, they haven't heard our father. So me and him are kind of, you know, back and forth. He's the captain and I'm, I'm the goal scorer. But, so I'm saying, no, we pray our father. So the father, okay, not oh, this pray our father. So I said, our father who art in heaven, I'll be thy name. When I was done, they were like, what? <laughs> Where did he get that from? 
from. Friends, I was taken back that these fine people never heard. Literally devoted. Listen, my first mass, I went there. I went to the mass and they do give, it's alcohol they serve. I was going back for a second. They said, you can't do that, man. <laughs> Stop that. Literally, the mother was the um, Wayne Heisinger's housekeeper. Yeah. Panther games. I, I, I didn't even like high, ice hockey. But they got, we went to box tickets. The prom, his mother, they had bought a brand new Acura. See, my mother had an 89 Cameron. And she wanted to give me the camera to go to the I said, I can't go to the prom with no camera. You crazy? I'm hot stuff. You see? And so she wouldn't rent no car. What am I going to do? I, said, I'm, I'm, I was in a dilemma. And Miss Guevara gave me her Acura. Listen, wonderful people there, man. Later on, well, Pablo became an Adventist. Amen. Yeah, he defected. Amen. His wife, Alice, became an Adventist. Juan defected from Catholicism, and he, was, he became a huge pastor in, um, at Calvary Chapel. And he, he's in Orlando. And the mother frequents the Adventist church in Fort, uh, the Spanish in Fort Lauderdale. So they, they've kind of defected, you know. But, no, I say this, say this now. One day I was by their home, and they were watching this movie called The Saint. It's, it's an old movie by Val Kilmore. And it's about a man who wants to be canonized as a saint. So I didn't know about this. This is new to me and, you know. And in the movie, it's a Catholic concept that in order for him to become a saint, he has to go through a litany of things, but he has to work four miracles. Yeah? And what has happened now, when we think of sainthood, the Catholic Church has monopolized that. When one thinks saints, one thinks Catholic. Yeah? We don't even use the term amongst us because we don't want to seem like we are holier than thou. Eh? But I'm a saint. From now on, call me Saint Not. <laughs> yeah, we're saints, brothers and sisters. It's a term that's used all through the Bible, fluently. Really, you find brother and sister, it's, it's a real term. Pure saints. So, the Bible calls them saints. Now, I did, a, I did a, uh, a study in the word saint now. So here are some of the texts that now give some insights of who these people are. If they were saints, fill it in now, they were taken out of every age. I'm going to show you. This is Bible. Look at the text now. And all these texts give us some insight about a saint. Psalm 16, verse 3. Look what David says now. David says now, but, but to the saints that are in the earth and to the excellency in whom is all the light. David says there were saints in all the earth not just restricted to one geographical area or one dispensation you know Peter made a, 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 a boo boo before Cornelius he was Peter had his issues he was you know with the Jews and Gentiles. And when he went to see Cornelius, do you remember this text? But God has showed me I should not call any man common or what? Not food. Any man. That's a funny way to spell food. Huh? M-A-N. Huh? Food. Man. Then he said now, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is not a what? Here's the punchline, but in, in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is acceptable unto him. We're looking at Abraham, the land of Ur. So when we think of the saints, they are not just restricted to one dispensation. In every age, God has always have his saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Here is the patience of the saints. So whoever these people were and are, we know one, that they were keeping God's commandments. 
That much is clear. Now, the second identifying mark of who these people were, right? They were taken from every age. That much is clear because saints were scattered. Second point is now, they were extremely generous to the cause of God. Just f That word is a pregnant word, saint. They were not just generous. They were extremely generous to the cause of God, to God's people. Where do you find that? Psalms 50, verse 5. Look what David attributes to sainthood or a saint. All right, Taylor, you writing? All right. I'm going to wait on Taylor, right? All right. Look what David says now. Powerful text. Psalms chapter 50, verse 9, 5. David says now, Gather my saints, Old Testament, together unto me. Those that have made a covenant or a contract with me, by what? By sacrifice. These people were extremely generous, liberal in regards to God and his cause. And I've discovered that true sacrifice is not measured based on what you give to God, but based on what you do with what remains. You didn't get Let me see it again. True sacrifice is not measured based on that one-tenth. Is what you do with what remains. They supported the cause of God. The fatherless, the widows, the orphans, the prophets. They would feed the prophet first before themselves. They put God's business first. And I've learned if you take care of God's cause, trust me, God will take care of you. Yeah. And so friends, listen, I'm telling you, and the kind of people who they represent, these people who are the and that type of them, they will be extremely generous. And God does love a cheerful giver. Yeah. They were generous. John Wesley, listen, man, if you ever have a ch if you ever get a chance to go to England. You are to go visit Wesley's chapel and his home. Boy, it's, a, it's, it's just a, a, a historic man. You, you get, I even saw the, the coat where the bullet, a bullet went through. Yeah, literally. And he was a small little man. He, he, John Wesley was like four feet, man. Literally. And his, he was like size three. Literally. But his saddle that he rode half a million miles on horseback, is preserved. It's a, a pristine museum. John Wesley once said this. Earn all you can. Give all you can. And save all you can. This is a powerful principle to live by. Generosity. Then he says now. Do all the good you can. By all the means you can. In all the ways you can. In all places you can, at all times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. That's a spirit of generosity. And the people who are resurrected at last would have been very generous to the cause of God and God's people in the earth. The fourth highlight I want to bring about these people, who they were. They held out for God until the end. E-N-D. They, they, they held out. They didn't quit or give in. Now watch it now. I'm going to the New Testament now. Right? In Ephesians chapter 6, verse, verse 16, Paul, he likens this concept to being a saint. Paul says now, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, in the spirit, watching thereunto with all what? Perseverance and what? For all what? So he likens perseverance 
to a trait of sainthood. Yeah. These are people who did not quit. They didn't give up. They didn't cave in. They did not apostatize. Yeah. They didn't renege on their religion. They weren't tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They were steadfast when it came on to certain points of faith. They, in spite of the opposition that they would meet, they persevered. And that's why Job said it, you know, in Job 17, 9, Job says, the righteous also shall hold on his way. He holds on his way. Yeah? He's not distracted. He's not diverted. He does not cave in. During the dark ages when, you know, the Catholic Church was, was butchering God's people, the, the reformers formed a doctrine, which we don't hear much about today, but it was a kind of encouragement. It was, it was formed, it was entitled, The Doctrine of the Final Perseverance of the Saints. That meant they persevered even to the end of life. And friends, you know, today that spirit is died, dead or dying in the church. People, I'm telling you, friends, we have a new breed of evidence today, man. You know, when I left the church, it wasn't because I had lost faith in the doctrines. It was because of the world, Elder. But even when I was in the world, you could not persuade me that Sunday was the right day. Or even, even try to invite me to know Sunday church. And I had resolved in my spirit when I decide to get back to religion, it's going to be the Adventist church. Today, I know pastors' children who have left the church and are now praise team leaders in non-denominational churches. And they speak of it as some enlightenment. He said to me, oh, she finds love over there. I said, what, what is love? What is true love? He was almost bragging that his daughter, who... Church school, kindergarten, Andrews left the faith and is a leader in a, in a first day church. That, that, that was enlightenment. Normally when we left the church, Elder, we hang out in the world. We hang in the world in the club and we do our club thing and then we go to a revival and we, <laughs> and we get rebaptized. Yeah? Friends, I've never known in my dispensation people leaving this church to become Catholics, Baptists, Pentecostal. Oh, that was strange. Today, people are just giving faith wholesale. And that is why, friends, perseverance is very important. I'm telling you, you see, this thing right here is not about winning the race. It's about finishing the race. Amen. I'm telling you, there's no text that says, he that come first. The first shall be last. Christ says, he that endureth, the same shall be saved. Right? We are told, not in your hand are so profound, she says, as the storm approaches. Look what happened now. GC 608, Philip, write it down. As it approaches, a large class. Do what? Who profess faith in the third angel. These are Sabbath keepers. They do what? But have not been sanctified through obedience. They abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. These are people who never persevered. And she says, by uniting the world and the same spirit, they have now come to view matters in the same light. So friends, the saints, these people who were raised when Christ rose, this I do know. I may not know who their names were or their ethnicity, but I do know they held out even to the end of life's journey. Last one now. They were precious to God. Very precious. Very, very precious. And David, now David is all over the Bible. David says it in Psalms chapter 16, 116 verse, verse 15. David says now, precious in the saddle of the wolf. The death of his saints. They were precious in life and they are now precious in, in death. Precious. Charles Spurgeon said this. To be blessed when we die, we must be saints. Amen. 
by nature we are sinners. And by divine grace we must become saints. Amen. If we would enter heaven. For it is the land of saints. And none but saints can ever enter or pass its frontier. Since, by, since death does not change the character, we must be made saints here below if we are to be saints above. There's no holy water, no hocus pocus can change one fiber of your character when you die. He goes on to say, our lives must be changed so we no longer love evil things but delight only in that which is true and generous, kind, upright, pure and godly. He goes on to say, we must be changed in every faculty and power of our nature by the same hand that first made us. Across our brow must be written these words, holiness unto God. He says, those who plan to be crowned in heaven must be uh, bear Christ cross on earth. No cross, no crown is still most true. Many would be saints if everybody would encourage them. But as soon as a hard word is spoken, they are offended. He goes on to say, the true saints of God are prepared to endure, endure scoffing, jeering, and, and, and scourging. They, ac scorn, they accept the cross of Christ without murmuring, remembering that he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Those who are to sing Christ's praise in heaven must first have been willing to bear Christ's name, shame below. They must be numbered with him in humiliation, or they cannot expect to be partakers with him in glory. Friends, the saints were precious to God. So let's not be concerned about their name. Let's focus on them character. Now, but let me give you a name, right? <laughs> Quickly, all right. There's a guy named Joshua in the Old Testament. Not Joshua, Moses' bodyguard. Different Joshua, the high priest, right? Now, you'll find that most of our pioneers, they believe that he was one of them, right? His name is in the Bible, so I'm going to give it to you, right? Joshua. Now, quick reference now. Joshua in Zechariah 3 was a Levite. He came from Aaron. He was a post-exile in Jerusalem about 538. So by the time Christ came on the scene, he's already dead. Right? He's mentioned in several places in Nehemiah 7 7. Right? Then came Zerubbabel to Joshua, or Jeshua, right? This, this priest, right? Um, the prophet Haggai also refers to the high priest, right? Haggai 1 1. Now, it, it would, now the, he, even though he was a priest, now it would seem to the fact that he struggled. He had issues. And it just shows the mercy of God, even while a man or a woman is ministering in holy office. Josh, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 7 now. 3, verse 1 says now. As I read now. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, doing what? Standing before the angel of the Lord. And Satan standing at the right hand to resist him. Now, why would Satan even dare come to this man? Because obviously this man maybe was doing something that Satan can say, Hey, 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 uh, 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 uh. Know him? High priest, is you crazy? Ephod, mitre, no, sir. He is mine. And rightly so. Verse 2 says now, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee. Where do you hear this word? Where do you hear this word? When he came to raise up Moses and Jude. Right? Oh, Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem, rebuked thee. Is not this a brand out of the fire? Profound. Watch it now. Now Joshua was clothed with what? Hold on. Why is he in filthy garments if he's a priest? He should have been in... Yeah. Maybe he's having... He's struggling. Even in holy office. Watch it now, right? And he answered and spake unto him, to those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him said, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass before thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of what? So God now brought his sins to him. Right? Confess. You have a question? Okay. Well, praise the Lord. All right. I'll work that right. All right. Now, number five now. And he said, let him set a fear mitre upon his head. So they set a fear mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua saying, watch it now. God is now making a contract with this man. 
All right. Let me read. You have a question? Oh, you, you need a mic. Get, get in the mic first because people are watching, right? All right. Thank you, Elder. All right. Verse 7 says now, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Watch it now. So God is now giving this guy uh, a deal. Watch it now. If, conditional, thou will walk in my ways, if thou will keep my, then thou shalt also judge my, and shall also keep my, watch it now, I, I and I, I, Jah, really I and I, will give thee, you Joshua, places to walk amongst these. That stand by. So if you do this, I promise you, I'm going to give you a position amongst these that stand by. Quickly, Ella, go ahead, Ella. Yes, Pastor. I, I was listening to some minister last night. Uh -huh. um, they were doing some Bible study. Yes. These ministers claim that they are present truth ministers. Are, well, they actually, um, between you know, the conference and also in present yeah. truth, now, as you were talking about names, yeah. I heard the minister was addressing others, others as you guys. I want to ask you, is there anything in the scripture that call, we said guys? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any scripture that, that describe us as that we are to address one another as guys? No. You know, I look up that word, pastor. Yeah. You know what that word means? Uh -huh. This texture, it means to belittle one. Mm. Are we supposed to belittle one another? No, we should Isn't always affirm each other. Exactly, another? exactly. So... When you were talking about the same pastor, yeah. I remember these ministers were calling one another guys. Yeah. I don't see that in the Bible. No, no. We should always we are refer to exactly. to call each other as brothers and sisters. Sisters, or even saints. Right? Our saints. Or by right. your name. Right. All right. Thank you for that point. Right. Now, so here's the promise now. I'm going to give you places. Of, now, what are these places now? Now, here's the punchline now. In Christ's object lesson. Now, again, by the time Christ came on the scene, he's already dead. Look she comments now. Cross object lesson, page um, 169. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel, angel and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thy iniquity to pass before thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fear mitre upon his head. So they set a fear mitre upon his head and also clothe him with garments. Now, watch it now. Then, with authority of the Lord of hosts, the angel made a solemn pledge to Joshua, right? The representative of God's people. If thou wilt walk in my ways, if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and also keep my courts. I will give thee places or a position to walk amongst these that stand by, even among the angels that surround the throne of God. Amen. Now watch it now. Let me put it together now. Now, around the throne of God in Revelation chapter 5, the Bible tells us the positions that are there. We have God himself. Yeah? 24 elders. Yeah? The four beasts. Yeah? And the 144 and the holy angels. Now, we know he could not be among the 144. That is end time people. Neither is he an angel. Right now, only two positions left. Maybe God took him and gave him position physically. Maybe. Right? Or, 24 elders now, there's, there's so many, there's, there's different schools of thoughts as to who these people are. Historically, historically, Uriah Smith says that these 24 elders represents those people, some whom Christ rose from the dead. Others side with Stephen Bohr, who say, um, some say that 24 elders are angels, right? And I've seen that study also. Some say that they are other worlds. I'm saying, we don't know who to believe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So every man draws his own conclusion and persuades his own mind. I can give you my thoughts, but that's only me. But my point is, if God keeps his promise, which he always does, Amen. some say now Joshua would have to have, been, have gotten a position or even be near the throne. And that's why they say now maybe he was one of them. 
that was raised when Christ got up. And the reason why I gave you him, because biblically I can find. Now again, I can give you a whole lot of names that they listed, but again, I can find no text. And the spirit of prophecy was silent. He doesn't give you one name of who these people were. No gender, nothing. It's almost like, but people saw them. It's the same reason why Julius Caesar predates Jesus by 100 years, a century. Today you can find pictures of Julius Caesar, but you can't find any picture of Jesus. You ever wonder why? No sculpture. I think providentially these things have been hidden from us because we are prone to idolatry. Boy, if we knew Christ was black, you, the, hello, you, the white man religion, we don't want that one. You, and and if, if Christ was, you know, European, Lord, holy, holy, you know, if he was Asian, boy, you know, it'd be a, yeah, one for the Asian. Yeah, yeah. one for our people. You know what I'm so providentially, now we know Christ has a complexion, and the Bible says we will see him as he is, all right? And we know, I've done my research, and I can, from my study, I know what kind of color he was. You know what I'm saying? But that's not his hair there. He didn't have an afro either. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no sideburns like Jason. No. So I think God just did not mention these people. So let's not pry into what he hasn't revealed. Let's just relish what he has given, right? They were saints. Now. Let's close. Let's start speaking for a minute now. We're gonna we're gonna close now. Ellen White now she now magnifies this. It's so powerful. Two two references. These are ages early writers now. There are some powerful underlining marks. She's commenting on these people, what they did, and who they are. Please read now. She says, "When Jesus, when Jesus, as he hung upon the cross, cried out, it is finished.' All right. The rocks rent. Uh huh. The earth shook, and some of the graves were opened. Uh huh." When he arose a victor over death and the grave, while the earth was reeling and the glory of heaven shone around the sacred spot, All right. many of the righteous dead, obedient to his call, came forth as witnesses that he had risen. Witnesses. Why witness? We were the disciples. They were afraid. Nobody was affirming Christ's resurrection in that time frame. Nobody. Pure confusion. We thought it was he who would have saved Jerusalem. We don't know what this resurrection means from the dead. We don't know. Witnesses. Please read now. Those favored risen saints came forth glorified. All right. They were chosen and holy ones of every age. Uh -huh. From creation down even to the days of Christ. So we can speculate Isaiah, Abraham. We don't know. We just speculate. We don't want to speculate, right? We want to make sure we are biblically sound, right? Please read now. Thus, while the Jewish leaders were seeking to conceal the fact of Christ's resurrection, it is now. God chose to bring up a company from their graves to testify that Woo! Jesus had risen and to declare his glory. Friends, that ought to comfort us. Today we see that the church is in a miasma. Listen, it's God's cause, you know. And if God, listen, if all else fails, he'll raise up the dead again. He did it once to finish the work. Let's do our part, amen? Please read now. She said now, those risen saints? Those risen ones differed in stature and form, mm -hmm. some being more noble in appearance than others. Mercy. I was informed that the inhabitants of earth had been degenerating, losing their strength and comeliness. Satan had the power of disease and death, and with every age, the effects of the curse have been more visible and the power of Satan more plainly seen. All right, you can read the rest. So... There they were. They raised them up every age to witness. The second reference now is in Desire of Ages. And this is even more, um, this is more intense now. Desire of Ages, page 7, 8. Please read now. As Christ rose. As Christ arose, he brought from the grave a multitude of captives. There it is. He led captivity. All right now. Fulfilling it, David prophecy. Please read now. The earthquake at his death had rent open their graves. And when he arose, they came forth with him. Here's now. They were those who had been co-laborers with God. Stop there. They were working with God before in life. Yeah? Working with God. Please read now. 
and who at the cost of their lives had borne testimony to the truth. Whoa, I see martyrdom. You see that? At the cost of their lives. Now I could tell you a whole lot of people who were martyred. You know, Jesus mentioned a man in the Bible. He said, there was a prophet named Zacharias who you guys killed. Yes, he mentioned. So, so we see, this thing is serious. Please read now. Now? Now they were to be witnesses for him who had raised them from the dead. All right. During his ministry, Jesus had raised the dead to life. Yes. He had raised the son of the widow of Nain uh -huh. and the ruler's daughter and Lazarus. What's the difference now? Please read now. But? But these were not closed with immortality. That's right. After they were raised, they were still subject to death. And they did die. But those who came forth from the grave at Christ's resurrection were raised to everlasting life. Here it is now. They ascended with him as trophies of his victory over death and the grave. When? Not at the first one. At the second one. Because he was the first fruits, the Omar. Please read now. These? These, said Christ, are no longer the captives of Satan. Mercy. I have redeemed them. I have brought them from the grave as the first fruits of my power. Ah, not the first fruit. The first fruits of my power. Big difference because Christ is the original first fruits. That's why he didn't need to bring them of my power. You see, he has the power to... Yeah. Right? Please read now. To be with me where I am. Never more to see death Mercy. or experience sorrow. Mercy. Right? Then she says, now these... These went into the city and appeared unto many. How long? For 40 days. That's over a month they were in Jerusalem. Appeared to many. Right? Declaring? Declaring Christ has risen from the dead and we be risen with him. Not I, but we. We. Please read now. Thus? Thus was immortal immortalized the sacred truth of the resurrection. See, prior to this, it was kind of shaky. But after this, we can die in peace. We can die in hope. We can die in confidence. And if Christ rose them, he's going to raise me too. You see, friends, please read now. The risen saints. The risen saints bore witness to the truth and of the words. Here's the text now. You see, you see I'm, I'm making this up now. Even the prophetess quote this text. Thy dead man shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Their resurrection was an, an illustration of the fulfillment of this prophecy. So the Isaiah was a prophecy he wrote, right? Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the, of the earth, for the dew is at the dew of the earth, and the earth shall cast earth, belch out her dead. Go ahead, Sister Esther. Uh huh. It did. So it doesn't matter if that is a thing. When you decide to believe a lie, yeah. Yeah. yes. Remember the Sadducees, and bear in mind, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were two powerful religious groups, you know. If they put you out of the synagogue, you was put out. So if the Sadducees said there was a resurrection, this thing was embedded in their whole DNA. And so this teach that the resurrection is a certainty. Yeah, and we can die in confidence. So for 40 days, saints, while Christ is in the upper room getting them prepared, these men are in every home, every crevice, every alley, bar, you name it. We be risen. Lord, are you that? Mercy. Let me touch you. I can't believe you did it. But, but, huh? could, could you imagine what the scene was like in Jerusalem? Let me tell you something. I guarantee you, if you see Ella Woodbine walk through this door right now, me know you guys take off. <laughs> you say, part of that, I'll run too. I said, boy, it's a ghost. Could you imagine what literally, brothers and sisters? Could you imagine? This is serious. Nothing. Not only did they see what was happening, they saw what happened, they were torn. Yes. They saw the earth. Mercy. And now they see the dead. Mercy. Remember when they said Lazarus, bring the dead back? Mm. They didn't see that. They didn't see that. 
Exactly. And, and the vast majority still didn't believe. Amen. Have mercy. All right, so 40 days now. He's wrapping up 40. Pentecost is coming. 10 days left now. Now, remember, they had 10 days to get themselves together. Because I'm going to tell you something. In Jerusalem, we're going to show you, there are about 2 to 3 million Jews in Jerusalem. The early rain only fell upon 120. So let me tell you, you can brag about being in the church all you want. This won't save you any more than it saved Caiaphas. And he was in Jerusalem. Now, we do encourage remaining the, with the system, yes. But it's more than that. You have to be linked up with Jesus. And they had 10 days to get them doctrine together. You, you, they were on the same page theologically. Peter wasn't saying, boy, I can't wear jewelry. This one said, you can't wear jewelry. No, they were, on the, they were one accord. Because clock a tick. You got 10 days to get your act together. Yeah. Could you imagine up a room? All that stuff was put away. And that's why they could receive Pentecost with gladness. Right? He's about to leave as I close. He's about to leave now. The final ascension now. Friend, this is so comforting. David also prophesied. David is all about prophesying everything, boy. And it's ama it is amazing that David was not taken to heaven. Because at Pentecost, Peter says, David is buried today. I'm, 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 what a, wow, I mean, come on, like, you know, but, you know, God knows best. But anybody, come on, David, now, I'm so you, you ought to be in the pink. Exactly, why did God leave him till first? Why not? It's amazing that God didn't, who knows? Well, probably we do know, you know what I'm saying? That Bechiba Isha boy, was a, that was a stain on your character, boy, I tell you. All right, now, he's leaving now. Final time, profound. Please read now, at the time, the time had come. The time had come for Christ to ascend to his father's throne. All right, now. As a divine conqueror, he was about to return with the trophies of victory to the heavenly courts. Oh, I love it now. Before his death, he had declared to his father, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Yes. After his resurrection, he tarried on earth for a season. Forty days. That his disciples might become familiar with him in his risen and glorified body. All right. Now he was ready for the leave taking. Mercy. He had authenticated the fact that he was a living savior. Yes. His disciples need no longer associate with the tomb. Did you hear that, brothers and sisters? You didn't get that one. Friends, you know, the Adventist church that we put more emphasis on the tomb than the sanctuary. Man, you, you, you think it's Easter fiesta. If we would we were celebrating 1844, now as we did Easter. Man, we would have been out of here. We need not take no vacation to no tomb, no Palestine. That's not where he is. And if you're, if, if, listen, if this won't move you, buy no trip to Palestine will not move you. Please read now. They could think of him as glorified before the heavenly universe. All right, now. She said, all what? All heaven was waiting to welcome the Savior to the celestial courts. Now, friends, you see, I, listen, I like to work at words because I use them. Now, when you say all, all don't mean some. Or somebody in the kitchen cooking, oh, me can't come, I got to wash the pots. All. All heaven. And heaven is a vast place. And we're told God's throne hovers around the universe. All have, please read now, as he what? As he ascended, he led the way, and the multitude of captives set free at his resurrection followed. Mercy! The this is no joke, you know. There's like a handful of, it's, like, it's like of every age. There's like, there to be a lot of people, not ten little people to get up. Huh? Not like a, far, like a church, far to be like a church. What a massive statue. Gender. Maybe children, who knows? I don't believe it was, it was pure men or pure women, male, female, children, youth, who knows? But it must be a perfect type of what he will come back for, a sample. Remember, if God accepted the first fruits, the harvest was guaranteed. Please read now. The, the heavenly what? The heavenly host, with shouts and acclamations of praise and celestial song, attended the joyous train. Yes. As they drew near to the city of God, 
the challenges given by the escorting angels. Now, this is where David, this is David now. David, she said they're quoting David now. David saw this, you know. Psalms 24, verse 7 says now, Lift up ye heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting door, and the King of glory shall come in. Joyfully, the waiting sentence responded, Who is this King of glory? This they say not because they know not who he is, but because they were to hear the answer with exalted praise. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up ye heads, O ye gates, even your everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Again is heard the challenge. Who is this king of glory? The Lord. The angels never get weary. Say it again, the man. You know, hey, friends, you ever heard a, you ever heard a new song? And it's a repeat, repeat, repeat. He said, who is it? Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. It was a massive reception. Now, friends, this blew my mind. Friends, that's why you've got to be there, brothers and sisters. Friends, I'm telling you, do, Charles Spurgeon says, let not the sake of a man's frown or a woman's smile cause you to forgo eternal life. If God goes, all is gone. Take the roughest way to heaven than to part company with your dearest friend. As he enters the, the sphere now, she says this, there is the throne and round is the rainbow of promise. This is now Revelation chapter 4 and 5 now. That's where we are now. She says now, there are cherubims. And this is the plural form. Cherub is singular. I am in the Hebrew is how you plural as a word. Seraph, seraphim. Cherub, cherubim. The commanders of the angels host. What? This is serious, you know. It's like a general coming through now. Every man's trying to salute the, salute the king. Watch it now. The sons of God. Right? Of the worlds. Now this is serious. The representative of the unfallen world sings. This is not a little light. Ten people in a room eating, you know, hot dog trying to get, no, no, no. It's massive. Now this one blew my mind. The heavenly councils before which Lucifer had accused God and his son. That tribunal, they are there. And this one now is a brain freeze. The representative of those sinless realms over which Satan had sought to establish his domain. God have mercy. What is this sinless realm you talk about then? We get lost in Pluto and Jupiter and Mars. Eh? What about What's a sinless realm? What's a realm? What is that? How do you define that, friends? This is serious, you know. And we're going to sell our soul for a Honda. Huh? <laughs> Minimum wage. Huh? 401k. You're going to sell your soul, brothers and sisters, for retirement. But we pay a high cost for a low living. Shame on some of y'all. Shame on us. Look what's out there. I mean, friends, all of this will be ours for the touring. Amen. Amen. We sell God so cheaply, boy. Shame on you, man. You need to get beaten with a belt if you ask me. Us. All are to welcome the Redeemer. They are eager to celebrate his triumphal glory. And as they come now, he does something. This is, this is, this is, all, this is, this is Christ. This is Christ all over. Please read now. As, as they now come to embrace him, she says, what he does now, please read now, but what? But he waves them back. No, no, no. Just clear. Back off. Back off. Back off. Please read now. Not yet. Mercy. He cannot now receive the coronet of glory and the royal robe. Mercy. He enters into the presence of his father. Yes. He points to his wounded head uh -huh. and pierced side. Yes. The marred feet. He lifts his hands, bearing the print of nails. Mercy. 
He points to the tokens of his triumph. Who are thee now? He presents to God the wave sheep. Woo! Presents God. Look, say that. that. Please read now. Those raised with him as representatives of that great multitude who shall come forth from the grave at Jesus. his second coming. Mm. Amen. This ought to comfort us, friends. Death is just a pause on the highway of life. It's a pause, you know. Please read now. He approaches the one. He approaches the father with whom there is joy over one sinner that repents. Mercy. Who rejoices over one with singing. Mercy. Before the foundations of the earth were laid, the father and the son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. Man. Please read now. They what? I love this. They, she said they clasped their hands, their lock arms in a solemn pledge that Christ should be the surety for the human race. You can't break this contract now, eh? Seriously now. They lock like a pledge. Then she says now, please read now. She says now, the pledge. This pledge Christ has fulfilled. Wow. When upon the cry cross he cried out, it is finished. Uh-huh. He addressed the Father. Mercy. The compact had been fully carried out. Yes. Now he declares, Father, it is finished. Yes. I have done thy will, O oh my God. Mercy. I have completed the work of redemption. Yes. If thy justice is satisfied, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Mercy. From that scene of heavenly joy, there comes back to us on earth the echo of Christ's own wonderful words. I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Yes. The family of heaven and the family of earth are one. Are one. For us our Lord ascended. Yes. And for us he lives. And I love this, friends. And because he lives. Yes. Friends, I'm telling you, friends, there is, we're in good shape this morning. Doesn't matter what your sin problem is. You're in good shape. Amen. We are told, Paul says, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost or the guttermost. Them that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. I thank God for this first fruit doctrine, friend. It is such a comforting and assuring doctrine. This thing is real. Amen. And friends, you know the sad reality? Only Adventists know this. Our first day friends don't have a clue about no, they, 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 they are still Easter Sunrise Sunday. They, they can't put it together. And God has given this to us to give to the world, brothers and sisters. What are we doing with this truth, right? So what then? As I close, where do we go from here, saints? Huh? Where do we go from here with this teaching? Friends, as I, as I survey the landscape, where do we go from here, friends? I like what the Apostle Paul says. As we leave this place, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, Paul says now, let brotherly love continue. Friends, as we leave from this place, may God help us. Fill it now to continue. In love. Amen. And the reason why we ought to continue in love because hate is too a greater burden to bear. Amen. You hear me, friends? Hate is too a greater burden to bear. And the reason why we should continue in love is because John, John 4, 16 says, because God, God is love. And as we love this is the insignia, the sign. Jesus says, by this all men shall know that you are my disciples. Not based on a tattoo or a gang sign that you can do the, the, you know, the spook dog. None of that stuff. Not by colors. This is the insignia that all men will know that you are my disciples if we have love one for another. And what kind of love is Christ here talking about? Not this weak sentimentalism thing that makes light of sin and, and, and you know, mock 
holy things. No! The love that God wants us to continue in as we, as we await the tabernacle is the true love. And the Bible says this love, I like what Paul says, this love doth not behave itself unseemingly. No. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Or think, some of us were too thin-skinned. Come to church, nobody say hi, I ain't going back. Huh? Shame on you. Nobody say hi to me. Friend, let me say, I go to church, I don't care who says hi or bye. I go because God would have his people. Now we ought to be kind, and don't get me wrong. But we are so sensitive. I easily, we, you know, I'm going to smile, I'm, then, then we're friendly. Then be friendly. True love, think of no evil. You can't leave this place and trying to get even, get back, and let that stuff go, man. That's some of you can't heal. The Bible says that that, that spirit, it dries up the bone. But I like what he says, it rejoiceth not in iniquity, but it rejoiceth in the truth. This is the kind of love that will bring us even through the gates. And that's why Franklin Bellin captures this song, this theme in a wonderful song. Tis love that makes us happy. Tis love that smooths the way. It helps us. It makes us to others every day. Like a minute now. God is love where his little children. God is love. We would be like him. Yes, tis love that makes us happy. Tis love that smooths the way. It helps us. It makes us to others every day. This world, this world is full of of sickness, death, all right, with loving, we'll do and try some. Let us all stand, please. God is love, we're his little children. God is love, we would be like him. Tis love that. Tis love that soothes the way, it helps us, it makes us to others every day. And when, and when this life is over and we are called above, our song shall be eternal of Jesus and his, like we mean it now, God is love. Where his little children, God is love. We would be like him. Yes, this love that makes us happy, this love that soothes the way. It it makes us to others every day. Most high God. Thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. O oh Lord, we are eternally grateful for what our elder brother Jesus did. He has now taken us in the heavenly places. And if we are faithful to him, in a short time we will be where he is. O oh Lord, you know that this Christian journey is no joke. It's a battle, it's a race. And we have our challenges, oh God. As our faces differ, Lord, we have inherited strong dispositions and propensities to evil. And they oftentimes gain the victory and the mastery over us. But Lord, today we thank you. You have given us one more week to demonstrate to the unfallen worlds who started the great controversy we are on. We think of Abraham, a man whom you called and qualified to be the progenitor of the race. And he stumbled and fell. He lied, O oh God. 
falsified truth. And you gave him another opportunity to redeem himself. You have given us this moment, Lord. May we not squander it. I pray that we will hold fast to our profession, O oh God, of our faith. May we not neglect the fires of morning and even worship. To be kind and compassionate. To be respectable. To demonstrate Christ-like character to those who are watching. And we pray, Lord, when we've done all we can, you will make up the deficiency. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. And let the words of our mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated.